So welcome to this panel. Uh, this Think Lima panel actually is, is not exactly an European panel. Uh, it's uh, the a, a summary uh, of the fundings of our project and also a preliminary taste of some of the fundings that findings that we have not published yet. So I will start, I am moderating this panel and I will start, which is not really polite, but because my role is giving like the umbrella uh, overview of the whole project. So you have to forgive me because I will be very fast and just mentioning uh, uh, the most important uh, results and pointing, pointing at the new ones that will be presented by uh, the three panelists after me who really are uh, providing uh, new findings to, to all of you. Uh, the, the panelists, as you have in the program, are Jose Antonio Moreno with press coverage of European climate change controlling think tanks. Then Marta Narberhaus, who will be speaking on behalf of Mirakin and also Jose Antonio Moreno for a case study of the EKI, the, uh, the German think tank, the largest German think tank, contrarian think tank. And finally, Shuk Kramsak talking about ecological NGOs in Spain and their discourse and their ideological denial, as we call it. So I will start sharing my uh, screen. So you should be looking at my PowerPoint now. And uh, what I will do here is uh, just present, introduce this Think Clima project, which is actually finishing, uh, officially finishing in uh, at the end of June, though it will be kept alive because we have so many things going on that we cannot really close it, but the funding and officially the project is finishing in this June. I will show you our theoretical framework and then I will provide uh, just some some insights uh, from uh, a number of our major output. So the project is a project which has been going on for four years and a half so far, funded by uh, the Spanish uh, a Spanish Ministry and also the European Commission, with members a number of members from the Universidad Pompeu Fabra, but also members from other universities. And actually I was thinking Marta Narberhaus should be here also because she has been collaborating so hard with us. She's not in the project, but almost there. The goal of this project was uh, examining the discursive role of think tanks in Europe regarding, we call it denial four years and a half ago. We don't call it denial anymore because as Timons has said, it's, I think it was Timons, it's a too narrow concept. Complexity is so big that we prefer these more expanded terms like obstructionism, for instance. But in any case, we call it denial at the very beginning. And we, in fact, we have gone a little bit beyond think tanks because think tank is a very slippery term, a very slippery reality that in some cases, uh, led us to go into the, the broader concept of interest groups. Then for the theoretical framework, we, we have published this uh, climate change denial and public relations uh, book with Routledge, which is where uh, more or less our theoretical background is more clearly stated, but mostly we like built on top of two different things uh, on one side, uh, there are so many different classifications and labels for the different types of denial obstructionism. For us, it was very easy to take Stanley Cohen types of denial, which as you know, was not uh, thought to be applied particularly on, on climate change and was a general labeling, but we thought it was very useful for us to separate the different types of research we have done the literal, literal and interpretative denial regarding the obstructionism regarding the facts of climate change and implicatory denial regarding the implications that uh, we are so reluctant to accept uh, that are inferred from the literal and interpretative uh, explanations. 
But we could not uh, have done this without the wonderful work of the US scholars, mostly also a number of European ones, like Dieter Pleve, for instance. But when we started, mostly there were the US community of people publishing about the US counter uh, movement. And that was super useful for us to take their findings as a starting point, not only for frames, but also for the network and the political economy approach. So I will present uh, here just a few uh, of our uh, papers and chapters and, and results, because we have more than that. Yet it's a summary of the different topics in which we have been able to publish uh, already, or we are uh, preparing or expecting uh, papers to be to appear in very short. There is the first part about the theoretical reflection, then the mapping, the mapping of the think tanks, but not only of the contrarian think tanks in Europe, but also the mapping of, of the mapping of all the think tanks talking about climate change in Europe. Then the framing of the implicatory denial, the framing, of course, of the literal and interpretative denial. The impact on media, which is uh, something we have done mostly at the ethical level, because the more empirical level is being conducted now uh, by Jose mostly. The network analysis of contrarian think tanks and also the political impact of contrarian think tanks on the uh, members of the European Parliament, which is a survey that uh, we are conducting now and expect to finish shortly, although it's very difficult because, as you may know, the MEPs are very reluctant to answer to service. So it's very hard to get uh, a meaningful uh, amount of answers from them. So I will uh, summarize the findings from these uh, five, uh, I think, most representative uh, researches from all this long list about the frames, about the implicatory denial, about the network, about the meat lobby in the EU, and about the meat tax debate in the UK. So uh, for the first, the little uh, interpretative denial, this refers to first the mapping of the contrarian think tanks in Europe, a task that was not so easy to do uh, because of first the language barrier, of course, but in the end, we think we managed to include not, of course, not the list of all the contrarian think tanks, but yes, the list of the most important contrarian think tanks, at least uh, the ones that uh, were published, publishing output in Spanish, in French, or in German, that were the languages that we could uh, understood. And to them, what we did was to examine the contrarian frames that we uh, picked up from the US literature. We adapted a little bit, but um, more or less were the same for a period of 24 years, which were the years in which we could find output in the websites of all those think tanks. And uh, what we conclude from this was that we think we can talk about a, 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 a replication of the US counter frame in Europe, uh, because all the frames from the US were found clearly in the European think tanks. We can also... Uh, I agree with uh, what has been said before here with this connection with neoliberalism. Uh, we also found that they were all blind to other sorts of key problems related to global warming. They were not interested in global warming and that a number of them were leading the, the dissemination of content, mostly the German and the British ones, although one of the Spanish ones, the Instituto Juan de Mariana, was also having a, a relevant role, not in terms, not from a quantitative approach, but from a qualitative. But the Germans and the British were by far the most important, disseminating contrarian frames in uh, through their, their media. Uh, then we uh, move to the implicatory denial. In this case, we chose uh, the, the animal-based diet. Uh, this is a paper which is not uh, yet published, but will be hopefully shortly. 
uh, by Mikel Rodrigo, myself, and Jose. The previous one I didn't mention uh, was by Marta, by Paco, and by Maxwell. In this case, we were examining uh, whether think tanks in Europe, but not only contrarian think tanks, but all type of think tanks discussing climate change issues in their websites, whether they were contributing to the lack of discussion in society regarding the impact of animal-based food on climate change, on environment. We thought that this was a very, very good example of implicatory denial because all, all the information we have nowadays about the impact of animal agriculture on climate being one of among, among the most important uh, global warming emissions and coming from, from the animal agriculture and from the food industries. So acknowledging this or not acknowledging this is something that we thought was a, a, a very good sign of implicatory denial. So we end up with a sample of more than 100 think tanks where also the contrarian think tanks were included, of course, but the majority were not contrarian, or at least not contrarian from this literal and explicit overt way of being a contrarian. And what we find here was that less than 5% of the text by all those think tanks address the negative impact of the animal-based food on climate. 60% of all think tanks of these more than 100 think tanks did not address the impact whatsoever. And there were only a few exceptions that really addressed the topic in a relevant way. Mostly again, British and German exceptions, but probably the most important exception was Chatham House with a very relevant report on the impact, not only the impact, actually it was not the impact of the animal waste food on the climate, but it was about the how much the public opinion uh, was aware of this impact. That was what was analyzed by Chatman Housing, but it is very relevant uh, report. So we conclude that think tanks in Europe, not only the, con the classical contrarian think tanks, but all think tanks discussing climate change were mostly making invisible this important impact. They were uh, not making any relationship uh, whatsoever between the animal-based diet and anything else important and relevant, not only climate, but human health, social justice, animal ethics. We also look at how they address, they'll discuss vegetarian, vegetarianism and veganism. And we see that uh, it was positively discussed when discussed, but the problem is that it was barely undiscussed. Only 29 texts of uh, hundreds of texts, including the two variables, the variable of the animal-based food and global warming on climate change. So this was for the implicatory denial, very, very surprising with this exception of Chatman House and a bunch of British and German think tanks. Then for the network, this is another paper which uh, we are refining now for publication in this case by uh, Jose Antonio Moreno, uh, Justin Farrell and Catherine McConnell and myself. In this case, we wanted to better understand how climate denial narrative is a spread and how discursive coalitions are formed. For this, of course, looking at the interest network analysis, looking at using this network and graph theory that we have also seen applied in the previous panel was very useful. In this case, we took a sample of a, a little bit bigger number of, of think tanks, 12, 12 in this case, contrarian think tanks. And we specifically look at the links among uh, individuals in them. So we identified the most important nodes, individuals that were connecting, were making connections among the European think tanks and among them and the US think tanks. And we also added to this research, uh, the disclosure of the gender gap. We wanted, we, of course we knew that men were predominant, but we wanted to know how much men were predominant within those think tanks in order to make any sort well, to, to be able to discuss the, the topic of the industrial masculinity and this the involvement of, of androcentrism 
in the topic of climate change contrarianism. Uh, the collection here was made uh, through uh, collecting all the individuals that we could find in the websites of these 12 think tanks, all individuals having key positions, uh, other relevant positions or being external contributors were collected that made for, for more than 4,500 individuals. And then we applied uh, the, the typical uh, data filtering and processing uh, method of network and graph analysis, looking for cluster centrality, density, distance, keynotes, and bridges. And then we obtained these uh, graphs that are so useful to identify, in this case, the most important think tanks in terms of their centrality, in terms of them becoming the central uh, point of a network of connections. So you can see the Austrian Economic Center and the Institute of Economic Affairs being the ones with larger centrality. While for instance, the, the AK German, which is uh, the one with the largest output, but it's not the one with the, the best centrality in the network, probably because AK publishes a lot in German and probably that narrows their Uh, their uh, th th their ability to to make connections. Sorry, because this is so sensitive that in some cases goes forth and back without me wanting. Uh, we could also build uh, similar maps in this case for the individuals to identify who are the keynotes, the individuals that become bridges uh, between the different uh, think tanks. Uh, a number of people uh, who, of course, that we, we researched a little bit who they were and that uh, some of them were also showing, the, in this case, the blue knots connections with the US. So in this map, you can see the blue knots are the people connecting with the US think tanks. And uh, well, th these people, a number of them were not, uh, at least we were not familiar as with who they were. Uh, a few of them, yes, like Nigel Lawson, for instance. The majority of them were people connected with uh, politics, uh, economy, or the academia. Uh, a number of them uh, very much related to uh, different think tanks because of their positions in, in them or their relationship or their work done uh, with them. A number of them, uh, if not all of them in the UK, also pre-Brexit people. And, uh, well, you see men, all of them, and that uh, brings me to the gender quota and the gender quota for female and male was confirmed about this uh, domination of a male in the think in the country and think tanks in Europe uh, with an astonishing 94% of male in the case of the Spanish Centro de de Covarrubias and a little bit less in uh, the Swedish uh, country and think tank of the sample. So the conclusions here were that uh, we can see that there is a network of structure also for the European climate change country and think tanks that they were too connected to neoliberalism to a large degree, and that there is a strong predominance of men, which we were we are able to discuss in the paper in terms that I have no time to do here. Uh, then regarding uh, the meat lobby in the EU, this is a, a smaller research I conducted myself uh, for a book, a book published by Sydney University Press. Here, I wanted to examine the public relations strategies of the meat industry in Europe. I applied a, a critical discourse analysis to uh, the output of a number of uh, the, the most very, very short number, because there are just three, four key players, key PR players in the meat industry in Europe. So from their websites, uh, very difficult because, of course, as everything related to PR, confidentiality and secret is must. But from their website, because they are compulsory, need to be a little bit uh, open and give information to their members. In their website, it's, in, it's possible to gather reports, summaries, uh, statements, uh, posts that in the end uh, provide the information we needed because uh, they need to 
inform their members and in a majority of cases they do it publicly not through an intranet but publicly in their websites and thanks to that uh, we could uh, collect this data and uh, here well the results were very clear about uh, the meat lobby following the strategy of the fossil fuel and the tobacco industries in the sense that they were they are downplaying the empirical facts and creating doubts about the scientific consensus. That means that mostly their main tactics are downplaying the, their role in global warming emissions, mostly by casting doubt about the scientific consensus regarding how much meat production and dairy production is polluting and it's a cause of global warming emissions. Uh, in spite of all the literature about this, uh, they are very successful in uh, just like just exactly like the fossil fuel and the tobacco did in just casting doubt. So uh, we don't we don't they say we don't deny the facts, but it's not so clear about because there are different opinions. There are scientists that you have not taken into account and so on and so forth. So uh, a very, a very successful way of uh, diluting the consensus about, in this case, the impact of meat and dairy in, climate, in the climate. They also, a second tactic is that they kidnap the discussion in the guise of science. That means that they are able to delay, to stop or to reshape policies or even not even policies, just the discussion by capturing the EU Commission's platforms for discussion. The EU as a uh, for instance, in the US, also it's very common, there are a number of platforms for all stakeholders to participate in discussions previous to uh, policy making. So the EU Commission can uh, listen to all the voices that have something to say. And uh, of course, the lobbies in general, they are very successful in, in being overrepresented in those platforms. And in this case, we could check that, yes, the mid lobby was overrepresented and was very successful in capturing the most important positions within these platforms. And that means guiding, shaping the discussion and being able to delay the discussion when they are not, they don't agree with the discussion or just to reshape it towards the direction that is more convenient for the industry. And finally, the final tactic uh, was constructing a counter narrative which in this case means uh, stressing that people need more information, that media misinforms the population, that the impact uh, of meat on health is overrepresented, that the impact of meat on the environment is overrepresented. And well, they have been very successful in delaying all sorts of policies regarding animal agriculture. And Finally, there is the meat tax debate, a research that uh, it's uh, also to be published shortly, in this case by Jose and myself, regarding a debate that maybe you are aware of regarding the, the, the suggestion that uh, was made by a think tank, actually, uh, to deliver, to put in place a tax on meat in order to cover the costs, the health and environmental costs resulting from using animals for food. Uh, apparently, there has been a debate about this, and we wanted to know whether there was a real debate and whether, well, think tanks and lobbies had something to do with it. So what we did was to map organizations in favor and against the meat tax in the case of the UK. We did it for the UK press through a discourse net network analysis uh, following Philip Leifold. And we found that there were 20 organizations in favor of the tax, mostly independent actors, and that there were 15 organizations against the tax, mostly lobbies and the UK government or UK government offices. And uh, in, short, in short, what we found was that we cannot call it a discussion. What happened was a reaction of uh, the industry, uh, or better say, a reaction of the pro-market conservative and neoliberal forces to promote climate inaction with the help of a number of think tanks, 
prominently the Institute of Economic Affairs. So we call it a, a, a sort of fake debate, which is a, a tactic very similar that we have been seeing uh, all these years uh, throughout all sorts of uh, lobbies and think tanks. And well, that said, uh, I'm speaking here, having explained this on behalf of the whole of the Klima team. And as I have said, Marta should be here because of her uh, wonderful work uh, with the German think tanks. And now I leave you with the three panelists, which are really introducing uh, new uh, data and new findings. So first I have to stop sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Am I and first? So, yes, you go okay. first. So if you want we'll to start. Prepare. We'll prepare. Okay, do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, and now do you see it full screen? Yes, I confirm. Okay, perfect. But do you, you don't see your cameras, right? Just the presentation, okay. The presentation and, and you, but okay, I don't know. Okay, perfect, you... perfect, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I am Jose Antonio Moreno. And I'm a member of the Think Climate Project, funded by the Spanish Ministry of Science, Innovation and Universities under a grant to uh, develop my PhD thesis uh, inside this project. So I will present my ongoing research about the press coverage of European climate change control and think tanks. Um, well, uh, the aim of this research is to discover the influence of the think tanks we have been studying uh, in the project. So um, first, I will talk a bit about the relation between communication and think tanks, and also which role have those think tanks played inside the climate control movement in Europe and well, worldwide, especially in the United States. Um, communication regarding communication um, thin tanks are the, the term of thin tank is a verbal container that implies a lot of uh, meanings and it could be referred to different organizations but what, what they have in common is that they are non-partisan organizations engaged in the study of public policy. That is, they try to uh, develop ideas regarding public affairs and policies that are being discussed in the public sphere, and they try to disseminate those ideas. So um, having that into account, uh, we see that communication is a special activity for think tanks because they rely on print, broadcast, social media, they dis distribute they, their publications to policymakers and journalists. They organize events to disseminate their ideas in, in conferences, in gatherings with policymakers, with uh, journalists, and they try to push to make their ideas visible and to influence policymakers according to their views. So um, a common discussion on think tanks is um, how do we measure uh, the influence that they um, have? Because uh, we tend to talk about uh, a lot about think tanks, but we don't know for sure how relevant they are or not. Um, a common strategy to measure that influence is the elaboration of rankings, such as the one of James G. McGann that um, elaborates a list based on interviews to experts, but another strategies are um, looking in the press or consulting policymakers. And this research is based on looking into the press. Um, that's important because um, think tanks can function as media agenda settles, but not in a sense of introducing new topics into the agenda but um, in, the, in a sense of um, providing ideas on an ongoing debate on a topic. So they influence uh, providing their views on topics that are being discussed by the media, policymakers, and so on. 
Um, if we look uh, into climate change, we can see that uh, there are 13 types of think tanks, especially the conservative ones, that have played an important role in the denial machine that disseminates the discourses of climate denial and climate deny delay. Um, in this sense, uh, think tanks that plays a role in the counter movement regarding climate change have uh, exploited uncertainties and have uh, functioned as a knowledge interest nexus. That is, they have provided uh, provided ideas and reports, summaries, and knowledge uh, to be used in that uh, battle of ideas and, and those fake debates about the climate consensus. Um, it has been very studied in the United States and in Europe, uh, we start to know about um, these, con these think tanks and this counter movement of think tanks. Um, we know that their role, their activities uh, have been recent. They, they are rising in the last years and we are starting to know more about them. But uh, despite knowing about their messages, we don't know so much about their impact. And to do that uh, is why I look into the press. Here, um, we have an infographic that the CSSN did that explains very, very well the role think tanks have in the climate control movement. Here, you can see that think tanks uh, provide uh, influence in the form of ideas, testimony, policy proposals, um, a lot of um, advice, uh, contents, academic outputs to influence the public, media and political agendas. And they are also connected to corporations, to universities, to trade associations in what is a network of obstruction, a network of, of influence to work against the climate action. I recommend you to check this uh, policy brief, this, no, this CSSN primer in their website because it's really short and interesting. Um, regarding my methodology, how do I look into the press to check if think tanks are influent or not? First, uh, I search into a numerographic database and then I perform a content analysis and some other methods. This is the list of think tanks that I study that uh, was drawn up from the study of the of climatic change, published in climatic change that Nuria presented before, plus some add-ins that I, um, I added from expert consultations on research in social media, in the news, in specialized media, to add some other think tanks that could be important for the press and that are in the line of the researched ones in, in, a, in the study of the project. And there are think tanks from different countries, speaking in English, German, Spanish, Sweden, Swedish, um, French. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, this list of think tanks is what I have looked into the press by using the tool called Factiva, that is a, data, is a database um, in which you can look for the press and, and they have an historical record very large. Um, I put the name of the think tank of each of the listed think tanks that I showed before, plus the keywords climate change or global warming and the same keywords in the country language of the theme to, the, to find uh, mentions in the local press, but also in the English speaking press in Europe by um, limiting the search to all European newspapers. For those theme tanks that are thematic about climate change, I just uh, looked for the name and the search was done since the foundation of the theme tank until December. Then I filtered and reviewed all the mentions to discard repetitions, wrong mentions, and errors. 
Then um, I did a content analysis to gather some information about each text that I collected. And probably the most important part is the portrayal. What is the, the objective of my research to see if they were uh, portrayed in a positive or negative way. Um, the positive mentions to the think tanks uh, in the press are those that praise the views of the think tank, that use the think tank's idea to nuance or to qualify an information in a piece of news. And um, in, in, in general, that creates a general uh, good sense of the think tank. The negative ones are totally the opposed, that are critical with the think tank's work or views, and that creates a bad impression um, of the think tank. And the neutral mentions are those that just are technical or are not um, positive nor negative. Um, they are really um, low. They, there are not so many neutral mentions. So um, then I did some complementary analysis that it also ongoing because there are so many texts what uh, con that consists on a quantitative word count with some automatized analysis to discover which words uh, which words are more often used by the newspapers to mention those symptoms and if that uh, word use is changing over time or not and then i will also like to apply a framing analysis taking the frame used in the myronet hall study um, to check if the positive mentions to the thin tanks in the press replicated some analysis, some, some frames that were um, used by the thin tank, some of these denialist frames. Um, well, um, here I will present some preliminary results because this is an ongoing research and I took a sample of press mentions of the Global Warming Policy Foundation think tank. Um, I took that think tank to, to, this, for, to this presentation and sample because this one is the most popular think tank in the press. In fact, the three think tanks from the UK account for the 86% of the mentions that I found in the European press to this uh, list of think tanks. Um, I will take these three to do this research because the mentions of Aiki are being studied in a case study separately with Marta and Mira and the rest of think tanks are not that popular. So um, regarding this sample of, thing, of Global Warming Policy Foundation, I took um, th 341 texts that cover from 2009, since the foundation of the think tank, to 2012. Um, most of the texts uh, included positive mentions to this think tank. They were mainly pieces of information, but also there were some opinion texts. Um, the motivation to, to include this thing down in the news was the quotation of a member, but also um, thing down's publication. And even in some texts, the author was a member of the thing down. But mainly it was because uh, some member was quoted to qualify some issue on public affairs, uh, on energy and these topics. Here we can see uh, the most uh, common words in these uh, excerpts. Um, I think it's interesting, although this is very, very quantitative, because it sheds some light on the kind of words that the newspapers use when referring to these think tanks. In the case of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, we can see uh, among the top words, uh, words related to the name of the think tank or climate change and related um, words, but then we can see that words 
such as Seith, Lore, and Lawson are among the top. And that indicates that this think tank uh, is very centered on the figure of, his, of this founder of the Global Warming Policy Foundation. And that the um, popularity of the person attracts the press to cover issues related to the think tank. Um, that's a strategy um, followed by the Global Warming Policy Foundation because they um, have some popular members, such as professors, um, academics, and ex politicians that are very well known by the press. So the press uh, tends to cover them when they make a statement regarding some climate change issues. Um, also, from this uh, brief analysis, it's interesting to see science, scientists, scientific, together with the word debate, which indicates that this think tank has achieved to introduce in the newspapers the idea that there is a scientific debate, because uh, that was their objective, to cast doubt on the climate consensus. And um, also, uh, sceptics uh, is a word that is interesting because it refers to the way newspapers refer to, to this thing tank instead of other more critical words such as denialists or contrarians that will be more hard, harder. Um, to end with, I would like to comment on quickly some examples of positive and negative mentions. Um, among the positive ones, we can see that it's common to see the Global Warming Policy Foundation uh, to qualify current affairs on climate change and energy. For example, this one regarding the Cancun Climate Summit in 2010, we can see that the newspaper includes the vision of um, the Global Warming Policy Foundation to describe the the summit as a great global warming circus that is on something very hard that can only be said if you quote someone because otherwise it will be a strong sentence to include in a newspaper um also in every debate on energy and green policies uh, it's common to see in this period from 2009 to 2012 the uh, to see the global warming policy foundation making um, qualification qualifying the, the information and may, providing the reviews, being, saying that green energies are very costly and green policies are not good. Also, there are some um, pieces that are opinion articles wrote by the uh, found, founder of the think tank, like this one at, uh, at the bottom of the table saying that the Global Warming Policy Foundation represents a turning point in the political and public debate. So this is a way to achieve a public um, influence and to make the things invisible. And uh, on the other side, the negative mentions are usually concentered in the concentrated in the Guardian and related to the funding of the Global Warming Policy Foundation um, also about the um, ideas that they discuss, especially uh, the uh, criticism about the funding is very common because they are very opaque. Um, newspapers try to discover where do they obtain the money from? Um, that's a common threat to for journalists to, to investigate. Also, there are outputs that criticize the, the views of the think tank, saying that they are misleading and so on. Um, well, this is an ongoing research. I hope to discover much more. And I think that from three years, I have already extracted a lot. So I think that looking into the press is a very good way to discover how this climate counter movement works. Um, I think that um, press mentions can give us um, very valuable information to, to see if a thing done and, and, um, 
planet contrarian organization is influent or not. In this case, the British ones are the most popular. Um, in the case of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, it could be also say that some norm of balance is operating here because journalists try to include the vision of the think tank when talking about um, the climate consensus and the climate change and policies and so on. I don't know if this is um, if we overcome this uh, and if this is happening right now. I will discover this. I hope. Uh, well, meanwhile, I advance in my research. Uh, well, I hope this was of your interest, and thank you very much for hearing this presentation. Thank you, Jose. So we move to the next one. I said Marta was uh, talking on behalf of uh, the rest, but I see Mira is also here. So uh, I don't know who, who is going to talk, but you can yes, go ahead. We will talk, both of us, if it's OK. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, OK. Uh, Mira, ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> OK. Um, can I share my screen? Mm -hmm. And you know? I have okay now it works okay okay thanks okay and okay do you see the presentation yes yes, yes. okay thanks so yes uh, Miranda I will present um, a case of study of the output and press representation of the German climate change contrarian uh, think tank Eike and that Miranda I quoted the German sample for the um, uh, Nuria's uh, mapping um, uh, study uh, of 2020 from uh, the Think Clima project and as ICE or the European Institute for Climate and Energy um, in English ha had uh, the highest volume of content of all the denialist uh, think tanks in Europe identified by the study. We saw the necessity to going uh, deeper in the ICAS climate change messages. We also thought that to determine how ICA has been portrayed in the European press was interesting and relevant for the project. So we started working with Jose uh, together. Uh, so the research examines um, both the communication frames that have been used by the think tank and the media representation it has uh, received in the European press. And Mira will tell us a bit more about Ike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you mentioned, and also for say before, uh, we looked into especially Ike because it has uh, such a strong output. And also uh, we found the name already itself is a bit misleading. So um, it's called Europäisches Institut für Klima und Energie. So the European Institute for, for Climate and Energy. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. And um, which kind of gives the impression that it could be a European institution, but uh, as a matter of fact, it's just a, or just a think tank with a postal address in the Eastern German city of Jena. Um, and its self-claimed mission is to counter-argue the adoption of climate policies to tackle the global warming. Um, and they deny the climate consensus in the sense that uh, climate change is not anthropogenic. So um, they um, deliver seemingly scientific arguments. Most their members are methodologists, scientists who claim that uh, climate change is not anthropogenic. And they even have a stage at the political level. So they're um, strongly connected to the far right wing party Alternative for Deutschland. Um, yeah, several politicians have um, cited ICA versus there are certain members of ICA who belong to the political party AFD. Um, and when we looked into the finance, it was also interesting because there's a um, yeah, strong counter movement of climate skeptics, denialists in the US, and they even have a financial link to IKEA as well. Um, so according to investigative media, um, IKEA has connection to the Committee for Constructive Tomorrow, CFACT, and the Heartland Institute, and both are have received finances by um, free market oriented organizations from right-wing foundations such as Mercer's or Koch Family or as well as uh, ExxonMobil. 
Okay, so taking this context in account and with the urgency to act to mitigate the climate crisis, it is necessary to identify uh, denialist um, or obstructionist uh, um, actors and discourses in order to counteract them and promote scientific communication that is commensurate uh, with the emergency situation. So the specific objectives of the uh, we had uh, were going deeper in the ICAS climate uh, change messages and determine how ICA has been portrayed in the European press. To do that, we separated ICA's data from the comparative analysis in um, Nuria's study uh, or Armin and, uh, and others' <laughs> study to illustrate in detail and uh, with excerpts the denials messages of this think tank. And this part consists of uh, a framing analysis. Uh, we understand, we understood frames as ways in which people perceive and describe an event. And uh, we use the framing theory applied to environmental issues, highlighting the complexity of formulating frames to communicate climate change following Lake of 2010. Um, the presence of the frames was, was coded for each text in binary mode. One mean, meant appears, uh, O uh, does not appear. And the repetition in the same text was not counted. So text examples of the frames and extracts were collected while coding. Um, I can represent 73.46% uh, of the total of uh, one, uh, 1,669 texts from the eight most prominent European climate change contrarian think tanks in, in the study. And uh, well, they, uh, I, these texts were gathered from its website by looking for climate change and global warming keywords, Klimawandel or Erderwärmung in German. And that produced a total of uh, 1,226 texts valid text in a time span from uh, 2008 to 2018. Uh, ICA was founded in 2007. Um, so the study looked um, for counterfeits in the think tank's communication output that is frames in opposition to climate consensus. And the press analysis, oh, sorry, it goes alone as well. Oh. The press analysis has been based on a content analysis methodology, as Jose um, already told, but um, specifically on this. Um, uh, we also, he also used the Factiva platform for gathering the text, covering all European press available in this archive from January 1st, 2007 because ICA was founded in February of this year and to December 20th, uh, 21st, uh, 2020. In this case, the total number of texts collected were 134 and the coding sheet included sections to gather data from the text, such as title, newspaper, country, language, date, uh, authorship, which could be a uh, press agency, journalist, a columnist, or not signed. A uh, reason for appearance, that means if a member was cited, a member was author of the text or academic publications from the think tanks or some uh, kind of event of the think tank, and the tone, which could be positive, neutral, or negative. And these were um, some of our uh, findings. We will highlight some of them. Uh, the counter frames um, and uh, focuses analyzed showed that, uh, for example, for the general scientific claims, the counter frame with more appearance was um, our A3, contesting scientific dissemination by politicians, media, and others, with appearance in 58% uh, of the text. Uh, about specific scientific claims, they found that the counterframes with more appearance where it is happening, climate change uh, or global warming, but it's not only us or it's not us or not only us or and it is happening, but any policy will be worse than warming. And for example, of the non-scientific claims with more than 70% uh, of appearance, we find uh, criticism of non-scientific defenders, messages, policies of non-scientific basis. 
Uh, regarding the main focus of the text, we found that almost half of the text analyzed have a scientific approach, while economics or ethics are uh, the last encountered approaches. And um, here are um, some examples we uh, took from the text. Uh, for example, um, contesting IPCC legitimacy, legitimacy uh, green energy technologies do not exist except in classrooms, computer models, or IPCC reports, algorithm lessons, at, and um, advocacy literature or for the uh, frame, it is not happening. Uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, storms, rocks, polarized, and sea levels are all within the historical range. There is nothing about them that is unprecedented and certainly nothing that justifies dismantling our carbon-based energy system. And uh, the for C11, for example, the text included a neoliberal or a neoconservative economic position, those who seek to regulate our lives, our life, uh, livelihoods and our standard of living want us to pay more for virtually everything, especially the energy we use to hit our homes, cook our food or drive our cars, which they would like to prohibit us from doing. Um, okay, Mira? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we looked, as um, Jose also already mentioned, into the IQS press mentions in the European newspaper. And uh, we used the Factiva database for it as well. And um, we wanted to see whether the press covered IQS appearance um, critically or reproduced the same um, discourse. And we found 134 valid texts, of which 89.55% um, were in German, 8% roughly in English and 2.24 in Spanish. And they were all um, published in 60 different European newspapers um, and among the most prominent, the German was the German Taz, um, Spiegel, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Schwarzwälder Bote and uh, Die Welt, which stand out, um, yeah, which we looked closer into as well. Um, in total, we found that um, the majority was covered negatively. So ICA was covered negatively in the press with a number of texts of 87, so 64.93%, whereas the text authorship was mainly uh, journalists. And the most prominent reason for, for ICA's appearance in the press was actually members of the organization being cited. That was the case for 40.3%. And then we looked into the distribution of the press appearance over the years. And um, yeah, as you can see, we found out that especially there was a huge increase of text appearance of ICA in the newspapers in 2019 and a decrease after again. And um, the, then we saw basically one reason for that could be that um, there was a link drawn in 2019 with the far right party AFD and climate um, skeptics. And the link has become very clear. And um, there was also the think tank Adelphi, which stated that the climate contrarian stances of the far right European parties um, um, yeah, acknowledged that ICA had a key role in the development of the prominence of the AFD. Um, so, in that sense, it became in 2019 clear and the press increasingly covered about the organization. Like the example um, covered, uh, yeah, just quickly, uh, before 2019 actually um, positively or neutral about IKEA and after 2019 negatively. So this also indicates that there was a shift of this discourse, yeah. Next. <laughs> sorry. No, sorry. And uh, yeah, to give you an example of, uh, of a positive tone of um, press coverage is um, by Die Weltwoche, which stated that they have no money, no publicity, and no mainstream respect. Climate change skeptics, Holger Tuss and Michael Limburg, but they are confident that the Germans too will come to their senses at the latest after the next blackout. And an example of uh, negative press coverage is. Uh, from Merkische Allgemeine. Nevertheless, the websites of the so-called climate skeptics are constantly haunted by the thesis that global warming is over. 
for example, the small but active lobby group with the imaginative name European Institute for Climate and Energy, but also some stakeholders from the economy come in handy for such a thesis. And another example by the Spiegel, um, the claims of these people and organizations obviously have more to do with their worldview, often with a strong aversion to government measures such as climate protection or corona prevention than with a science debate. Yeah. Okay. So um, from the framing analysis and uh, the press coverage, we can come to some uh, fast conclusions, which um, are that Ike is a stronghold of climate denialism in Germany with a large output, but its press presence is scarce and rather negative. Ike's large output resonates with well-worn denial arguments studied in the USA also, and its relationship with the for right party IFD uh, makes this think tank re re relevant enough to be included in the discussion on the climate counter movement and in its influence and popular uh, in the press also. Although this coverage is mainly negative, the relevance and this think tank and views are having is increasing until the point of reaching the parliamentary furrows, especially in the, in the last um, years. Um, the low press attention, less than 10 texts per year in all the European press and Factiva, and is concentrated in Germany. But we have seen that it spikes in uh, 2019 and 2020. And well, we can see how it uh, will go on. And uh, that would be Ike's case. And uh, well, thank you for your attention and please contact if there are any questions. Thank you, Marta and Mira and, and Jose again. And thank you for being so on time. So we can move now to the final presentation for this panel with Shuksa. We, Shuksa is going to talk about ecological NGOs in Spain and a, a little bit different topic, though very much connected. You can go ahead, Shuksa. Okay. You look my presentation? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Okay, good morning or afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I am Suksa Gramsak. I am a researcher, a PhD in communication. I'm part of the Think Clima team. Um, and I'm going to share my doctoral research with you, which is named Environmental NGOs in Spain, Discourse, Ideological Denialism and the Climate Crisis, which is part of the research project in Clima. Okay, this is a summary of the presentation to explain the step by step. Um, my objective. First, the objective of this research is to analyze the speeches of ecologics NGOs in Spain regarding the causes, the consequences, and the possible solutions to climate crisis, with the special attention to the specific uh, themes that correspond to the ideological denialism of climate change. Specifically, problematize the animal-based diet. Uh, first, the human overpopulation the economic ground and the technology as a solution. And the objective is evaluate to what extent these NGOs contribute with their discourse to disseminate solutions allay with the problems detected by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The specific objectives are demonstrate that some environmental NGOs in Spain function as think tanks. And they are generators of knowledge. It means uh, the regular publication of reports and original documentation on climate change. And on the other hand, analyze the defined frames, the framing and speeches used by environmental NGOs in their publications regarding the four topics under observation. And third, compare the dominant message in relation to solutions or actions to fight the climate crisis among the NGO, NGOs studied. 
Okay, my theoretical framework. Within my theoretical framework, there are five developed perspectives. Um, the first one is the climate change denial. Um, some interest groups have played an important role in the creation of a climate change denialist movement, which has formed a coalition of experts, lobby and advocacy consultants who influence the policy decisions in their interest and who sow doubt in the scientific consensus and promote the idea that uh, that there is a scientific controversy regarding the climate change. And here are some authors who developed this theory. In order to, the second one is the ideological denial of climate change. In order to understand the climate in action, denialism has been studied in relation to the solutions that have been positioned by the IPCC to face the climate change which are conditioned by anthropocentric beliefs. This implies the ineffectiveness of the solutions since the latest indices indicate that climate change is not being mitigated. Uh, human interests are prioritized over non-human species. And here are some authors who developed this theory. The third one is the interest groups theory critical approach. The interest group tried to influ influence in the public policies through the lobbying. Um, think tanks are producers of new ideas, uh, the knowledge and interest. Among the perspective or theories to study these groups is the critical perspective, which points out that not all groups have the same level of influence, noting that those who have less also serve the power. The power. Here are some authors who develop this theory. The fourth theoretical framework is a critical discourse analysis perspective. Um, this is a perspective that adapts to the object of the study, focusing on the effects of power relations and inequality on other relations in the social process. And it is a critical perspective that focuses on a social problem and the role of discourse in the production, legitimization and reproduction of domination or abuse of power. Here are some authors. And the last one is the anti-speciesist perspective. <laughs> this perspective points out that the problems have a human and natural context and arise from oppression in general. Therefore, they are related. So if environmental change is to be generated, social change must take place. This perspective understands the oppression by the culture, nature, and human-non-human -human dualism for which intersectionality is, is used. And it considers all forms of, of oppressions. From the critical animal theory, it delves into anthropocentrism criticize exploitation, objectification, and animal consumption as, as food. Okay, the methodology of my study, the um, four environmental NGOs in Spain were studied. Among them, uh, we have Greenpeace, World Wildlife Found, Friends of the Earth, and Ecologists in Action. For this purpose, we use the quantitative methodology, a frame analysis, with the question, what is the presence and position with respect to the four uh, themes or issues? And of the, on the other hand, a qualitative methodology through critical discourse analysis, with the question, how do environmentalist NGOs position the four team, themes in their discourses? So, my sample period was from April 4th, 2004 to December 26, 2018. The number of documents analyzed were 1,323. Um, 1,283 short form texts. There are news in web format, news in magazine format, and opinion columns. 
uh, for for this, the methodology applied was the frame analysis, and the selection criteria was the relevance of the four topic study. And 40 reports, 10 per NGOs. Uh, the methodology applied was a critical discourse analysis, and the selection criteria was the same, the relevance of the four topics study. The four topics was animal-based diet, the human overpopulation, economic round, and technology as a solution. The results. Okay, in the presence of topics, the majority was obtained by the theme of, of technology with 78%. Uh, in second place, we have economic round, third, pla third place, animal-based uh, diet, and the last one, overpopulation. In the animal-based diet representation frameworks, the majority was undefined. Um, these are those cases in which there are positive or ne a negative proposition, uh, explicit and or implicit, and also whether it postulates a moderately about the animal-based diet. In the overpopulation representation frameworks, the majority was undefined too, with 100%. And undefined was in those cases where positive and negative position explicit and implicit are shown, and also the position that it is only necessary to moderate or mitigate the control of reproduction and population. In the economic round representation frameworks, the majority was negative with 80%. The negative, the negative representation is when explicit or implicit pretty sign economic round, um, the capitalist and or neoliberal system also its overestimation and eff effects on climate change and or negative mentions of the market, the private property, the minimal revolution and the privatization, etc. In the technology representation frameworks, the majority was positive with 65%. This frame is presented as a solution at a general or everyday level, and its use is also overestimated and the risks are underestimated. Blaming citizens or politicians and or valuing technology as a, an, an elixir. Okay, in the um, critical discourse analysis, the 77% perpetuate ideological denial through the treatment of topics of interest for research. The 20% are critical of these issues and the 3% it doesn't refer these issues, although it does address global warming itself. Uh, in, this, in this result, it is, it's important to know that the rhetorical uh, device most fre frequently used in the critical discourse analysis where the citation of source, the modality, the omission, the passive verbs, the presupposition, the personification, the active and passive agents, the paraphrase, the metaphor, and hyperbole. Okay, my conclusions. The first conclusion related to my objectives uh, this research points out that NGOs play the role of think tanks, but in a partial way. It means uh, they reproduce and repeat the ideas put forward by academia and science. And they are not generator of new ideas, are independent organizations and specialists in their area. They collaborate in disseminating discourses uh, for the formulation of policies based on an ecology criteria and are in accordance with academia and science. Two, they have a positive framing on technology, negative on economic round, 
and, and defined on animal-based diet and overpopulation. The environmental yields studied are not consistent in their critical stance, at least for the issues analyzed. Greenpeace, uh, well, despite perpetuating ideological denialism, Greenpeace, it makes the diet problematic as of 2017. Uh, World Wildlife Found identified uh, some of the key issues, but keep faith in this technology. And Friends of the Earth and Ecologists in Action partially identify relevant issues with respect to the ideology behind the problem of climate change. In the dominant message, uh, Greenpeace and World Wildlife Fund positioned the idea that the consumption of animals is a problem for the protection of planetar planetary and human health. Also, World Wildlife Fund um, points out that technology allows us to adapt to climate change and be a solution. This message is also pointed out by Friend of the Earth, as well as to depend on technology can be dangerous or negative. On the other hand, Ecologies in Action positions the message that uh, there are discourses that cover up the commodification of natural assets and false solutions to climate change, and that it is necessary to be critical of the model and solutions that are given to climate change. And there is a new faith in technology transmitted by power groups and the media and that is necessary to have a critical perspective regarding it and the myth of happiness through consumption. Okay, the discussion of my research um, and the question is um, why do ecological NGOs impliedly perpetuate the ideological denialism of climate change? According to the, the research, NGOs fall into moral anthropocentrism because uh, they don't identify the roots and multifactorial ideological variables of the climate crisis. They promote the reduction of diet based on meat, but not from animal ethics. They have confidence in finding uh, a technological solution. There is a lack of problematization of human overpopulation and the worldview underlying the critique of economic growth is based on belief in technology and science as the solution. They also give more importance, importance to it than the, to the other topics. Okay, well, here are some authors of the bibliography using this research. Uh, there are many. <laughs> and there is all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and your interest in this presentation. If you have any doubt or questions, uh, don't hesitate to write me or tell me. <laughs> thank you, Shuksa. Thank you so much.